you. <clears throat> uh, I don't, I'm going to play a little quiz now. Can anyone remember what I spoke on last time when I spoke? Honor. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Good to know that, that our talks have real power and impact for people's lives. Uh, it's a way of honoring, isn't it? No, I spoke on honor last time, faith and honor. It was part of our last series. Sorry? About sarcasm, yeah. That wasn't sarcastic. It's true. It's good to honor. Um, but yeah, we're, it's quite strange. I spoke on faith and honor, and now I'm speaking on loving one another and honor. And you kind of think, well, maybe God might be wanting to say something both to me and maybe to others, hopefully through me. Um, I really believe that honor is... Uh, important, and I really believe that God has got something uh, for us uh, today. You know, honor is very important in God's eyes. Um, I'm not going to cover too much. I'm going to try not to anyway. I'm, I'm going to try not to repeat what I said last time. You can go and listen to that online. It's probably still there. Um, but I, I do believe it is important uh, in God's eyes. Uh, we are honored in his sight. Do you know that you're honored by God? Do you feel honoured by God? Three or four people. We are honoured by God. This is what it says. Um, This is from the the Passion Translation, but you could go and read it in any other translation as well. In Psalm 8, it says, Compared to all this cosmic glory, why would you bother with puny mortal man or be infatuated with Adam's sons? Yet what honour you have given to man, created him a little lower than Elohim, crowned him like kings and queens with glory and magnificence. As lords of creation, you have delegated to them mastery over all you have made, making everything subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. We're given honor directly by God. In answer to our question, why should we honor one another? Well, if God honors each of us, that's a pretty good reason. If we see God doing something... We ought to be doing the same kind of thing. But it goes on, obviously, to say that we are God's image bearers. We know that from the story in Genesis, that creation story where, you know, we see that God makes mankind in his image, male and female, created in God's image, reflecting who he is into the world. And that means if if we carry God's image in each of us, surely we are to honor one another and to draw out that image. And I believe that's one of the things that honor does. As we honor one another, we call out that image. We draw out the reflection of God. We call out gifting. We prophesy into people who they truly are and what their identity is. And that's why, you know, hearing what's happened to Emma and that story, I I get excited when people come alive in God. I get excited when God transforms a life, when he takes hold of it, when he, uh, you know, instills fire in it because we become more like him. But Emma didn't stop there. When that happened to her, she then went and sat next to a homeless guy, you know, Homeless people are often dishonored in our society. We look at people in our world and people make judgments all the time about where we place honor, who is honored in our society. And those that are down and outs, the have-nots, are often those that are dishonored. And just sitting and having a cup of coffee and doing no more would have been honoring. But she went further, didn't she? Emma then was able to share something of her story and she imparted something of the life of God into him. Honoring people doesn't have to be difficult, but it is something that God values and that he calls us to. In in James uh, chapter 2, it says this. How could we say we have faith in God and yet favor one group of people above another? Suppose an influential man comes into your worship meeting wearing gold rings and expensive clothing, and also a homeless man in shabby clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the rich man in expensive clothes and say, here is a seat of honor for you, right up the front, but you turn and say to the poor beggar dressed in rags, you can stand over here or sit over there on the floor at the back, then you've demonstrated gross prejudice among yourselves and used evil standards of judgment. Your calling is to fulfill the royal law of love as given to us in scripture. You must love and value your neighbor as you love and value yourself. For keeping this law is the noble way to live, but when you show prejudice, you commit sin and violate the royal law of love. We're called to honor everybody, whoever they might be, whatever their life, whatever their background. Not judging people according to who they are, what they look like, their performance, their race, their attitudes, how nice they are. 
because everyone carries the image of God within them. God's honor is not restricted to a certain class or certain people. You know, we, we are royalty in the kingdom. We don't live by a class system in that sense. There is no hierarchy. We are all directly children of God. There is no one who should be honored more or less than another. Society often honors by achievement. Well, it used to. It's probably slightly more by achievement and whether you're already famous. There are plenty of famous people out there who seem to have the limelight who don't seem to have done anything these days. Um, but th there is this sense in which we honor people either because of the way they look or what they've done in society. And it is good to know that that isn't how God honors us. Because when we live under that system, it's a fear-based system, we end up judging ourselves and thinking permanently that we're never quite good enough. We never quite live up to the mark. Honoring in God's system does away with all that. It removes fear. It brings security. It transforms life, lives. It instills peace into people in any given situation because we can know who we are in him. It is entirely counter to how the world gives honor to people. You may remember last time, it's another little test. Um, I spoke about uh, Bethy, my daughter. When uh, she's, she's now in year one uh, at school, so she's not been in the schooling system all that long. Um, but at the beginning of year one, she, she's quite good at maths, but she was struggling. Um, because any time they gave her anything that was a bit of a stretch and she looked at it and she thought, I can't do that, she didn't want to try. She'd got this somehow, um, unfortunately, probably from Mel and I as her parents, um, but she'd got this idea in her head that she had to achieve. And if she couldn't get the right answer, then it became a struggle and she didn't want to try it because she wanted to do well. She wanted to achieve. She wanted to uh, succeed. And yet, obviously the difficulty with that is, what happens when you then face something that is bigger, that is beyond where we stand at the moment? It limits, doesn't it? When we only focus on achievements, when we only praise and honor those who are successful, we limit people. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't praise people when they do well, but I don't think that should be our ultimate criteria. We've, with Bethia, and with the help of the teachers in the school, we've uh, we've looked at honoring her and encouraging her in a different way, looking to encourage her efforts uh, and her trying. It doesn't matter whether she gets it wrong on one level because there are people around who can tell her what the right answer is. She's only six. She doesn't need to know all these things to get through life at the moment. But in learning, she's got to be able to be willing to take a risk and to step out. And that is what we're trying to foster. So we're trying to foster at the moment that effort, that encouragement, that risk-taking. And I want to suggest that that is the kind of honor that God places over us. You know, we, we probably look at our own lives and look at the times when we mess up and the things we've done wrong and we beat ourselves up over that. But actually, the praise from our Father in heaven is, look, that is my son. That is my daughter. Look at them. Aren't they great? You know, you've only got to read Hebrews 11 to see that that is how God treats his people. You know, we read the Bible and we see how all these heroes of the faith failed and stumbled and took things into their own hand and made mistakes. You read Hebrews 11 and God's view is they never stumbled. They didn't uh, falter in their faith. You know, Abraham was steadfast. He never doubted, according to God. That is the honor that God gives us. It looks beyond the mistakes at the heart. I'm not going to make any political statement on SATs here, um, but SATs have been in the news quite a lot of late, uh, if, you've been, if you've been watching them. Um, and SATs or any other testing system um, can cause quite a lot of stress on kids. I was never overly worried by tests myself growing up, but Mel, I remember, used to be horrendous. Um, she used to get in quite a lot of panic uh, when it came to exams. And I, I can picture something like that for, for Bethia, um, that you could see that if, if something didn't change, if the focus didn't shift for her, I imagine she would find SATs and tests like that quite difficult. There have been protests. You know, there have been parents keeping, people off, keep, keeping their children off school, rightly or wrongly. I'm not making any comment on that. But, but it is interesting that these tests test the knowledge. They test the outcome. They test... Um, whether we get a right answer or not. They don't test the process or the effort. And I can understand why people would find that stressful. Now, 
all across social media around the same time as all this stuff on SATs, there's been quite a lot of people posting about the school model in Finland. Um, and it, it is interesting, and I just wanted to bring it in as, as kind of a contrast, really. Again, um, not suggesting necessarily uh, that our school system ought to change to be exactly like theirs. Um, they have quite a different setup in life anyway. Uh, in parts of Finland, obviously, it's dark for quite a lot of the year and quite a lot of the day. So the, the Finnish school children have the shortest school week anywhere in the Western world. Um, they only go to school for 20 hours a week. Um, and they also have the shortest school year in the world. Um, now, back in the 60s and 70s, um, they, they, these kind of global rankings in education, um, Finland were about 28 or 29 in the world, roughly equivalent to the USA. They decided that wasn't good enough, and they decided to change their schooling system, which as a result meant pretty much changing their entire society, because it's quite difficult to have a really short schooling day and have no parents around to then pick up the kids or look after them. So the whole of society has been impacted by this. Um, but what they do, these kids, they don't have homework. Um, their schooling system largely involves playing and exploring um, and learning how to socialize. And uh, there's a little interview with this maths teacher. Pete, what's your main aim? Not, not wanting to put you on the spot, but as a maths teacher, what's your main aim for your students? They learn maths. There's an interview with a Finnish, you, you'd think it's obvious. Um, there's an interview with a Finnish maths teacher, and he was asked, you know, what, what's your hope for your children? What's your main aim? And he said that they learn how to be happy. They learn how to socialize with one another. They learn how to be good people. And this guy went, but aren't you the maths teacher? And he went, yeah. <laughs> but my main aim is something different. And so in the Finnish system, they teach children how to honor one another, how to respect one another, how to grow as human beings. And within not very long after they changed the system, they shot to number one in the world rankings for education. Something shifted because there was a confidence in the way the children then approached their learning. It wasn't all about whether they got it right or wrong. And they were willing to risk stuff and try things. It's probably fair to say, though, they're not number one anymore. Um, recently, there was new rankings that came out, and there's been massive investment in education in some of the uh, Asian countries, and some of them have shut over. But they're still number one in Europe, and still number one in quite a lot of areas within education. And they've been there for 20 odd years. But it's interesting, that system that has generated a culture in Finland where they want to honor. Teachers are one of the most honored professions uh, in Finland. If you're a teacher here, and you're looking for someone to get a bit more honor, go over there. No, maybe don't. Maybe don't. We want to keep you, really. Um, but it is, it's an incredible place, it seems, for that. They've changed their culture based around an honor system. And as a father to these two beautiful children, Bethia and Joa, that's what I want for them. I want them to grow up in a culture of honor where they don't have to worry about comparing themselves against each other and measuring standards that are set by somebody else saying, this is what you've got to achieve and live up to. You know, I want them to do well in school. I want them to get good grades, but I would rather that they grow up happy, confident, secure individuals that knew that they had something to bring to the table, that their contribution was unique and they were confident in bringing it. I would rather that. I, that'll probably get them further in life, to be honest, uh, even in our society. I want their effort and their risk to be the things that are praised. I want to honor them for when they try, for when they do stuff. And I want to see them honoring one another. And rather than competing, so when one of them comes to me and says, look what I've done, isn't this great? Rather than my other kid coming to me and going, no, no, look what I've done, this is better. I want them to be going, well done, that's really great. You've done something excellent there. I want them to be praising each other. That is the kind of culture that I want for my kids. And that is the culture I want for us because I believe that it reflects the heart of God. It sets people free. It builds security. It opens up lives. You know, honor can involve many things practically. You know, it can involve things like speaking well of one another, encouraging one another, um, treating one another well, letting our yes be yes. If that's honoring to somebody when you say you're going to do something, do it. That's honoring. Uh, keeping our promises, being on time for stuff. When we say we're going to be there, turn up. Um, sticking to agreements. There's a whole host of things that are practical that we can do around honoring, not gossiping, not talking behind one another's backs. 
seeking opportunities to promote one another and their gifts. Honor builds community. It helps people find their place. It creates safety and security. And dishonor is a sin because it destroys that. It destroys that community that the kingdom wants to see established. In Romans 12, it it calls us to love one another with brotherly affection, to outdo one another in showing honor. I mean, that's a challenge. That whole passage in Romans 12 is all about living in practical love, and honor is this kind of pinnacle of the chapter. Honor is powerful. Having individuals who honor is powerful, but a community living in a culture of honor, that's transformational. And that's precisely what our world around us needs. It's attractive. Wouldn't you want to be part of a community where you're constantly encouraged and blessed? Where you constantly and permanently feel secure and safe? Where it's possible to step out and try new things, knowing that you know, you're not going to get ridiculed, and if things don't quite go right, you're not going to get pulled up on it, but instead you'll be encouraged to try again and maybe have someone come alongside and input you and add their gifting and their skills. Honor and a heart of love that it flows from brings blessing. It releases us from fear. It brings goodness. It establishes security. It restores dignity. It transforms lives. It builds identity. It releases gifting. It creates character. It draws out excellence. It releases the image of God in his creation. And it releases the supernatural. Do you want to be part of that community? Because that is our calling, to live that way. I'm not perfect. I'm not modeling it in its fullness, but I know I'm called to it. I want to encourage us on that journey. We all have a part to play. We all have a unique contribution to bring. We are all created with purpose and destiny, and we are all called to be a people who are transformational and release the kingdom of God into our community. One way of doing that is as we honor one another and as we seek opportunities to honor those in the world around us. So I want to encourage us this week, find those opportunities, pray for boldness, and then just do it. Thanks, Dan. And building on his story, we're just going to hear a couple more stories, testimonies. So um, I think there was Margaret who wanted to share one. I think Rog- Roger hasn't got a testimony anymore. He's not going to bring that today. And Andy wants to bring something through. So 